Well, hi. Everybody good? You feel all right? All right. My name's Jesse Reeves. I am the family pastor here at the Austin Stone, which means that I oversee kids and students. And we actually have our students here today. Welcome. I cannot be responsible for anything that they do. Actually, I can, so y'all be good. I gotta tell y'all, this is a true story. This happened to me at the nine o'clock. I was sitting right there on the front row. Aaron was leading perhaps one of the greatest songs ever written, Come Thou Fount. And I say that because it's so honest. That verse that says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. That verse right there, I think, is the most honest verse that's ever been written. Because I feel that. I carry that. And right here today, sitting on the front row, Aaron's leading that song. He's on the first verse, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And I'm just blown away by the lyrics. I'm sitting there li reading the lyrics. I've written several songs and I've never written a song ever as good as that. When it says, teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above, I mean, come on. I'm sitting there and I'm like, Lord, that's the best words that have ever been penned. And in an instant, I had this thought. I thought, I really should have got a haircut. <laughs> That's a true story, sitting right there. I'm dialed in, singing the praises of God. The next thing I'm thinking, I should have got a haircut. These people aren't going to listen to you. They're just going to think you look like Jesus. <laughs> right there, I'm having this thought. And then I thought, well, Jesus was Jewish. And so I started going down this rabbit trail. And I'm just wrestling with my own thoughts, trying to focus on the eternal. And then it keeps turning back. I'm having this whole dialogue with myself. And then we come to the verses right after that, right after my little fight with myself. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. I'm like, God, that's me. I can't even stay focused for this long. Is that just me? Anybody else in that boat? Here's the deal, people. That's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the helmet of salvation because we have a very real enemy. And that enemy attacks us. He doesn't want us focused on the eternal. He wants us focused on ourselves, on our immediate. So every time our minds wander like that, it actually should just be a red flag to us of a deeper spiritual thing that's going on. Because like this scripture says that we're about to read, we do have an enemy, and it's not flesh and blood. If you have your Bibles, just go ahead and open to Ephesians 6. It's where we've been camped out for a couple months, the armor of God. This is what I'm talking about. Ephesians 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of the evil and heavenly places. That's what he's saying. We're in a fight, but it's not against flesh and blood. Therefore, take up the armor of God so that you may be able to withstand in the day of evil. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And verse 17, take on the helmet of salvation. That's what we're talking about today. 
the helmet of salvation. Now, because I teach kids all the time, we're going to break it up into two parts. The helmet and salvation. See how that works? Helmet and salvation. It's the helmet of salvation. First of all, the helmet. What does a helmet protect? It's not a trick question. Your head, your brain, your mind, your understanding, your resolve, your theology. That's what Paul's telling us to put on, is to guard your minds. See, Romans says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, then you'll be saved. So it seems to me that it should be a breastplate of salvation, right? That's where your heart is. So why is he telling us to put on the helmet of salvation? You put on the helmet of salvation because our enemy will try to attack your mind. He'll try to come in and create doubts in your mind that eventually, hopefully, would make you walk away from the faith. Does that make sense? That's the passage that we're dealing with today. The helmet of salvation. So what is salvation? Salvation literally means to be rescued. To be brought from death to life. Jesus didn't die on a cross so that you would be better people. It's not that you were okay, you were kind of bad, and you just needed a little nudge. So Jesus died on the cross. No. Jesus died on the cross because you were dead in your sin. And he literally rescues you and saves you. Okay? He saves you from what? Sin. He saves you from sin. Now, there's a guy named Tim Keller that's way smarter than me. And you just got to hear this. I think they're going to put it on the screen, but if not, just stick with me. Because you have to get this or you can't get anything else. Tim Keller says this. See, since the garden, man simply decided to live life independently. That is a picture of sin. That's what the scripture says sin is. And as soon as you do that, there's a disintegration that happens. The Bible insists that every problem there is, spiritual, psychological, social, physical, and cultural, every problem you can imagine is a result of the deterioration of the universe and the human condition that comes because of separation from God. Everything. Check this out. If you don't understand that, you can't understand salvation. You can't understand the breadth of salvation unless you understand the breadth of biblical concept of sin. The term salvation means to be saved from sin. If you don't know what you're saved from, you have no idea what salvation means. One more sentence. Just listen to this. That means, friends, everything from measles to racism is a result of sin. Everything from your guilt feelings to war and poverty is a result of sin. It's all part of the breakdown. That's what we're talking about, being saved from sin. Now, here's the deal. If you've been raised in church, a lot of you have, we talk about being saved a lot. When were you saved? I was saved when I was seven. I was saved when I was 21. I was saved in prison. I was saved, I was saved, I was saved. We always talk about being saved in the past tense, don't we? We always talk about it in the past tense. And here's the deal. The Bible says the past tense is true, it's necessary, it's real, but it's just the beginning of our Christian walk. Does that make sense? In fact, the Bible says that every Christian stands in the middle of three tenses of their salvation. Past, present, and future. Past, we were saved from the penalty of sin. Present, 
we are saved from the power of sin. And in the future, we will be saved from the presence of sin. This is so important when we put on the helmet of salvation. Because we have an enemy that wants to come in and attack each one of those, past, present, future, to create doubts in your mind about any one of them. And we're going to look at all three. But that's his scheme, is to put doubts. That's why we put on the helmet of salvation, to guard our minds. That's what we're dealing with today. Now, here's the deal. Before we keep going, I'm just going to take one second to say this. We are saved, according to the Bible, from sin. I'm going to take one second to talk about what we are not saved from, according to Scripture. Okay, this is going to be a little bit of thin ice, and I know that, but I'm happy to go out on it. According to Scripture, we are not saved from poverty, persecution, struggles, or problems. Hello? See, here's the deal. We're saved from the penalty of sin and from the power of sin over our lives, but we're not saved from poverty, struggles, persecution, or problems in this lifetime. Make no mistake, there is a day coming when we will be saved from those, but that is not today. You're like, well, why does that matter? It matters because we live in a day and age when there is a false doctrine that is sweeping our nation. I know, I feel the tension. <laughs> sweeping our nation. This says, if you come to Jesus, all your problems will go away. God just wants you to be happy and rich. He wants you to have your best life now. Can I say that? <laughs> I know. He wants you to have a $65 million jet. In the words of the great philosopher of our day, the notorious B.I.G., <laughs> mo money, mo problems. And I'll tell you what the problem is. The problem is there was a guy named Jesus who said in John 16, 33, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He also said in Matthew 8, 20, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. One more, okay. John 15, 18. Jesus says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you're not of the world, because I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you? A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. That's in your Bible. That's why it's important to understand what the Bible says salvation is. In order to really grasp this and to illustrate the point, I want to think just a second about the guy who wrote this. Who wrote this letter of Ephesians that told us to put on the helmet of salvation. Now, if you've been in church for a while, don't tune out. Just stick with me. It'll be short. If you haven't been here, let me tell you. This book, along with 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament, almost half, was written by one guy. His name was Paul. Okay? His name was not always Paul. and Originally, his name was Saul. Saul was a high-ranking Jewish official. 
Saul was religious. And most importantly, Saul hated Christians. Saul personally had them, had Christians bound up, thrown in prison, and killed for their faith. Saul. So, you've heard about the road to Damascus where Saul was converted. Saul on the road to Damascus. We always hear about that. Do you know why Saul was on the road to Damascus? It's in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen, the first martyr, was killed. First Christian martyr. And not only was Saul there, but it says that he was giving hearty approval. Saul starts building steam, and in Acts chapter 9, it starts with saying that he was still breathing out murderous threats towards Christians. He goes to the high priest, and he gets a list of names of everyone that was pertaining to what they called the way, which I wish we still called it that, Christianity. He got, literally got names of everyone in Damascus belonging to the way. And he was on his way down the road into Damascus to have these people bound up, dragged back to Jerusalem, put on trial, and killed for their faith. That's why he's in Damascus. He's walking down the road, and this bright light shone from heaven all around him and blinds him. And Jesus himself appears to Saul from the light. You're like, well, how do you know Jesus was in the light? Because, Acts chapter 9, a voice comes out of the light and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, who are you, Lord? And the voice says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So in this one instance, Paul has a face-to-face encounter with the risen Lord Jesus. And his life is never the same again. He is changed in that moment. You could say Paul was saved on the road to Damascus. In fact, Jesus gave him a new identity. He said, you're not even going to be called Saul anymore. You're going to be called Paul. And Paul is our hero of the faith. It's the same guy. He was saved. Past tense, one time, right then. But that's not where the gospel ends. If that's where the gospel ends, then you could say the rest of Paul's life is going to be filled with rainbows and unicorns. He's going to be happy. He's going to get rich. Right? I mean, he wrote half the New Testament for the love. There's got to be some royalties in that. (laughs) But unfortunately, that's not the gospel. In fact, if you have your Bibles, just go ahead and turn over. We'll see what happened. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. This is what happened to Paul when he put on the helmet of salvation. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-three. 23. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger of rivers, danger of robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger on the sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from that, there's the daily pressure on me 
of my anxiety for all the churches. That's what happened to Paul when he put on the helmet of salvation. So here's the question. Why didn't Paul just walk away? It would have been the easy thing to do. Just quit preaching the gospel. Have you ever thought about that? Why didn't he need to do that? He could have gone back to his old, comfortable life, being a leader, making money, but he didn't. Why? Well, he answers that question in a letter that he wrote to his friend Timothy, the second letter he wrote to him, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. He's talking about this gospel, and he says, For which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, which is why I suffer like I do. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. I know it. Do you see that? That's the helmet of salvation. I know it. That's being convinced of something because you've experienced it. That's not knowing it like I've heard somebody talk about it. It's I know it because I've experienced it. That's why he says I'm convinced. But if you look at it deeper, this verse has all three tenses of salvation in the same verse. Look at it. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. That's past tense. And I am convinced or persuaded that he is able. That's present tense. To guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. That's the future. Past, present, future, all in one verse. And like I said... We have an enemy that wants to come in and make you have doubts in one of those areas. And that's what we're talking about today. It's kind of like this. This is not a perfect illustration, but just go with me for a second. I want to show you a picture of my wife. That's Janet. Some of you have seen Janet. Some of you know Janet. But I know that that is my wife. Janet. Do you know how I know that? Because on July 19th, 1997, almost 18 years ago, I stood face to face with her in an altar. I was there, trust me. <laughs> okay, well, I have proof of it. Look at this. That's us right there. Why are you laughing? Fellas, that's called a bait and switch. I'll tell you about that later. I was there. I had a wedding and I was married. Okay? But that was my wedding. My marriage has been the last 18 years. We've been through good times. We've been through bad times. We've been through hard times. We've been through crazy times. We've been through great times. And all the while, Janet and I have had a close, intimate relationship with each other. That's how I know. You cannot say anything or do anything to me to convince me that that's not my wife. I know it is. This morning when I woke up, you know who was laying next to me? Janet. (laughs) I was married, past tense. I am married. And until the Lord comes back or until we go home, I will be married to who? Janet. That's what Paul's talking about. I know. You can't convince him because he's seen Jesus. 
right? So that's what he's talking about with the helmet of salvation. Past, present, future. And you have to understand this because the enemy will come in and he'll try to create doubts for any one of those so that you'll despair and so that you'll walk away from the faith. Let's look at them real quickly. Past. It's true. It's past. It was paid for. Jesus Christ on the cross paid our debt for those that are in Christ Jesus. God's wrath was poured out on Jesus. He paid the penalty for every sin that we have ever done for those of us that are in Christ Jesus. That's why Paul says in Romans 8, 1, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Some of you need to hear that this morning. There is no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. Because in a room this size, I guarantee you, there's people in here that think there's no way God could ever forgive me for blank. And you carry this guilt and this shame with you everywhere you go. And you think that you are disqualified from the faith because of X, Y, or Z. That's how the enemy will come in. He'll come in and try to convince you that there's still more penalty to be paid for your sin. Can I just remind you of something? The same guy that wrote Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, is the same guy that was the Christian killer. That's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that God Almighty would choose a guy that used to kill Christians to write the majority of the New Testament. What he's telling you is that there's nothing that you could have done that is bigger than the grace of God, the grace of Jesus. Romans 5 says, where sin abounded, grace abounded more. Does that make sense? That's why we put on the heart, the helmet of salvation. So when the devil comes against you for your past, which he will, that you can stand on the truth and say that there's no more consequences. So how will you attack your prison? If all we ever talk about is the past, then you're confused when we get to verses like Philippians 2.12 that says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling, for God is at work within you both to will and to do his good pleasure. What in the world does that mean? You're like, you just told me that we're saved by grace, and now you're telling me that we have to work it out with fear and trembling. Yes. Both true. You were saved by grace. You couldn't do anything to earn it. God saved you. And now you work it out with fear and trembling. Back to the marriage analogy. What would it look like if Janet said, hey, babe, will you take out the trash? And I said, well, I have this certificate right here that says July 19th, 1997, I married you. We're married. I don't have to do anything else. How do you think that would go over in the Reeves house? I do what? I take out the trash with fear and trembling. (laughs) I'm kidding. Sort of. Why? Because I'm working out my marriage. Paul goes on to say it a little differently in 2 Corinthians 4. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians 4 for a second, so you might as well turn there. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6 
For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. ESV says, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What that's saying is the same God that spoke and the earth was created, he spoke and light was separated from darkness. That's the same God who now speaks into our heart the light in the face of Jesus Christ. It's God. It's all God. That's the grace. Look what it says. But now, we have this treasure in earthen vessels or jars of clay. That's where that comes from. In earthen vessels that the excellence of the power of God may be of God and not us. We are hard pressed on every side yet not crushed. We are perplexed but not despair. We are persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Do you see that? God's grace, God does it, God speaks the light into our hearts. Now we carry this power, why? So that God can be on display. You know what this is not saying? It's not saying that your circumstances change. It's saying that you have the power of God in your circumstance. You remember when Paul and Silas were in prison in Acts 16? Y'all remember that story? They were in prison. They're chained up. About midnight, they start singing songs of worship to God, which is what you should do. And there's a great earthquake and the doors of the prison fly open and all their chains fall off of them. What did Paul and Silas do? Get up and run? No. They stayed right there in the prison. Their circumstance did not change. Why? Because the jailer woke up and he saw the doors open and he saw the chains laying on the ground and he assumed all the prisoners had escaped so he drew his own sword and was about to commit suicide and Paul said, don't touch yourself. We're all here. We're all here. The jailer turns around. You can read it. Acts 16. The jailer turns around, falls on his knees and he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved That's his question. See, sometimes God wants to leave you in a circumstance and put his power in you in that circumstance so that other people can look how you deal with that circumstance and other people can come to know Jesus. Does that make sense? So how will the enemy come against you on your present? He comes against you and he says, if you're going through these hard times and these struggles, then it's probably because either you're not saved or because God's not real. And you start doubting it. I can't tell you how many times I've heard the same story. Some of our best friends, the wife has this story. I used to go to church. I was saved. I was baptized. But then blank happened fill in the blank, and I walked away from the faith. That's what the enemy wants you to do. What putting on the helmet of salvation means is that in this circumstance, I'm going to stay here with the power of the risen Jesus in me, and I'm going to praise him in hopes that other people around me may get saved. That's why Christians live in poverty. Some to show how you should live in poverty. That's why Christians get sick and die, to show people how to get sick and die with their hope in Jesus Christ. That's what separates us from the world. 
Okay? Are you still with me? The past is the penalty of sin. The present is the power of sin over us that we're saved from. And the future is the presence of sin. Look at 2 Corinthians. You're still there, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Just going down to 16. So we do not lose heart, though our our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul was beaten, he was shipwrecked, he was hungry, he was thirsty, he was stoned, they tried to kill him, he was thrown in prison, and what does he say? He calls them light and momentary afflictions. People, if we can get the helmet of salvation on and we can grasp that, it's so much better. If we can start seeing our current struggles in light of the future glory, that's how you make it through. Paul never focused on his problems now, his afflictions now. He focused on the future glory. And it just makes everything else just pale in comparison. That's how he can call them light and momentary afflictions. So how will the enemy come against you when it's dealing with your future salvation? Two ways. Number one is he gets you so focused on the afflictions now that you don't even ever think about the future glory. If he can get you where you're consumed about thinking about your marriage problems or your job problems or your unemployment or your kids' problems or whatever, if you're consumed with that, that's all you think about and you never think about the future glory, that's exactly what the enemy's trying to distract you from. That's one way he can come against you. The other way is a lot more subtle. And I submit to you it's also way more prevalent. And that's this. He may just give you everything that you want. You're like, what? He may just give you everything that you want so that you become so confident in your own success, in your own money, that you don't see the need for a savior. Like I said, that's more prevalent. We live in a rich society. And all he has to do is get us focused on the here and now, how comfortable we are, and he can lull us to sleep in our own success so that we never even think about the hope of glory. See, friends, you have to look at success the same way you look at the afflictions. You have to look at them compared to the future glory that's coming. That's why there's verses like 1 Corinthians 2, 9 that say, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor heart of man imagined what God has prepared. We have no clue. But if we can focus on that, how awesome it's going to be, how amazing it's going to be, it makes everything else fade away. Friends, that's what's putting on the helmet of salvation is. Think forward. Think future. Think future glory. That's what Jesus wants us to think about. Now, I'm going to land this plane. But as I do, I want to just make one little slight turn. Naren, you guys can come up. I've studied Saul on the road to Damascus probably 7,000 times. Maybe, roughly. A lot. I've studied it a lot. And as I was studying this time for the helmet of salvation... 
There's a verse that jumped out to me like it never has before. If you have your Bibles, go on and turn over to Acts 9. This is Paul on the road to Damascus, Saul. Acts chapter 9. You remember why he's going? He's got a list. He's rounding up Christians. Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 3. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. And suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you'll be told what to do. Look at verse 7. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. People, can I just tell you, when I've I've been praying about this a lot, I'm convinced that there's many people in this room right now that are just like those guys who hear the voice but see nobody. You may come here week after week after week. You may hear the word preached. You may sing the songs. You may hear the sound, but you see no one. Friends, what putting on the helmet of salvation means is you see Jesus and you know Jesus. Past, present, future. I pray that Jesus will open up your eyes today so that you don't just hear, but that you can see Like Isaiah said in chapter 6, that you'll see him high and lifted up, the train of his robe filling the temple. Do you know that this Jesus hung on a tree for you and he took all the condemnation for you so that you can be saved? Would you just bow your head and close your eyes? If that's you, would you pray today that Jesus will open your eyes so that you can look in the face of Jesus, that you may see him and know him, and know that only through Jesus is there no condemnation for your past, that only through Jesus do you have the power in your current circumstance to display God's work. And that only through Jesus will we ever see the promise of the day that's coming when there will no longer be a presence of sin. Ask him to open your eyes. In Jesus' name, amen.